Sorry to push you guys along. I know it's fun to chat to each other. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Andrew Douglas. I'm the Executive Vice Dean in the School of Engineering and an Emeritus Professor in uh, Mechanical Engineering, where I got to play with really good guys like Kevin. Um, so welcome to the 2023 Billy Croft Lecture. And I'm really excited to be here in person with you. And we're pleased to offer today's lecture in partnership with our home department, Mechanical Engineering, uh, and part of the graduate seminar series that Mechanical Engineering has. So I'd like to welcome all the students here today. Um, so I'm not actually going to introduce today's speaker. I want to talk more about Gordon Craft and uh, Fred Billig. Uh, essentially, these are two wonderful alumni of the YA School. And I want to specifically welcome the Craft family in cyberspace. Um, so that's the magic of post-COVID um, times. Uh, Gordon graduated uh, from Johns Hopkins in 1956. Now, most of you think that I was a full professor at the time, but I was not here yet, so. Um, anyway, he got a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering and then built a remarkable career in finance, uh, including the establishment of a highly respected Croft Leominster Investment Management Company right here in Baltimore, uh, which he managed with his sons, Kent and Russell. Now, the important thing about Gordon is that he has a true uh, appreciation for the overall importance of engineering in our society. He thinks deeply about things that are important to our nation and is passionate about being a catalyst for change, positive change. He cares about the work being done here at Hopkins, and that's why I really appreciate him. And he stays involved with our programming and people on a regular basis. And actually, it's broader than just a whole bunch of things. So, John Reardon sitting over there, uh, Gordon was very influential in stuff. John did, and so on. He is a terrifically loyal supporter of the Whiting School in many ways, uh, not only because of this lecture, but there were some scholarships he established um, for his home area of Port Tobacco in Charles County, and um, he's provided generous and what is important to deans, flexible support um, to invest in interdisciplinary programs. And he's done so much for the school that we decided to name Prof. Paul in honor of Gordon's many years of wonderful commitment and generosity. So thank you to Gordon and thank you to the entire Croft family for the foresight you've got in establishing this lecture and for the foresight you have in supporting the School of Engineering, which is going from strength to strength. Gordon is always thinking about the most meaningful ways to give back to the school. And I know this lecture in honor of his friend and mentor, Frederick Billing, is a special place so just a quick word about Fred Billick. He received his undergraduate degree from Hopkins in Mechanical Engineering in 1935. And then he went to the Applied Physics Labs. And here is where the connection is made with our speaker today and with Kevin Hemke. Um, so if I were to tell you all the accomplishments of Dr. Billick, it would take all of our time and uh, Dr. Mamoto would not have a chance to speak. But um, while he was there, he was uh, focused his research on high-speed air breathing propulsion for advanced flight vehicles, including pioneering work for the Air Force in external burning and supersonic combustion. And he did that until 1996 when he retired as associate head and chief scientist of the aeronautics department at APL. Now, just this morning, Kevin, and I were in a meeting and I walked out of the meeting. I said to Kevin, thank you for allowing me to fly transatlantic uh, on a jet with two engines and they never fail. And that's because of the work of the and the and so on. These materials are good these days, right? I mean, you can even drop your phone and it's so <laughs> I don't know how you do it. Anyway. Um, in the spirit of generosity that Frederick Billing embodied, Gordon Clark created this lecture to bring inspirational people to our campus in the hopes of motivating our students, the faculty, students in the back, back in the front, um, <laughs> and members of the Hopkins community in cyberspace. So, without further ado, let me ask Kevin Hemke, who is most importantly my colleague, but also the Decker Chair and Professor of Mechanics. So 
Well, thank you, Andrew. I know old guys like you think of airplanes as structural materials, but there are lots of avionics in them. <laughs> HRL is one of the world leaders and actually a lot of the things they design there. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's building lecturer, Dr. Leslie Momoda. Um, Dr. Momoda received her bachelor's in chemical engineering in the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. I learned last night that she saw the light and changed material science <laughs> and engineering for her master's and PhD, also at UCLA. So we have strong connections there. Um, and, and, and then she, she is currently the executive vice president of HRL Laboratories. So for those of you who don't know, that used to be called Hughes Research Laboratories in Malibu, and it's now HRL Laboratories LLC in Malibu, California. She leads the strategic planning, customer, and LLC member interfaces for the laboratory. She has a very important role there. Um, in the leadership of the laboratory. Prior to this, be before coming the executive vice president, she was the director for Sensors and Materials Laboratory, where she led the research and development of advanced structural battery architected and, and architectural nanomaterials and characterization, as well as cutting edge microelectronic MEMS and infrared, infrared detectors being extremely important. Uh, she joined HRL in the 90s and work on research and the development of mixed metal oxide materials for electronic, optical, and chemical sensor applications. So again, the emphasis on, on sensors. I had the privilege of getting to know Leslie and her team when uh, Jamie Guest and Tim Weiss and I had a DARPA project uh, called MCMA that was run, and, and, and we teamed with them and were both performers and, and really developed strong collaborations. I had the privilege then of being on their advisory boards for a number of years. It was always the highlight of the year to be able to go out and hear what all the year eight people were doing. And then the people that were in the trenches would tell me, and we have this great boss we want to go introduce you to. And that was a, a boss that was a great leader as well as a great scientist and visionary that could understand what they were doing. So with that, I said, I've got to find a reason to get Leslie to Hopkins. I think finally got her today. So thank you for coming and the floor is yours. Thank Doesn't you, Kim. Thanks to everyone for coming. Uh, what I hope to speak to you in this lecture is an appreciation from an industrial perspective of how at HRL we approach uh, next generation base in structural materials in this talk. Um, but I'll give you a brief overview of HRL, how I came to HRL, how we pick projects that we do. I'll give you some uh, flavor for how architecting materials. I'm so pleased to meet many of the faculty here who still are carrying on the architecting materials uh, legacy, which did morph into additive materials, which seems to be uh, the rest of um, top and strength. And it's been really great to see. And then kind of a, a, some of the business perspectives and, and where we, we see it going and what happened to kind of architect and additive materials at, at HRL. So with that, All right, so um, as Kevin said, I am a material scientist, chemical engineer by training, and I have been at what was the Hughes Research Laboratories and HRL Laboratories for a number of years. Um, and when I started, I was a researcher, just like many of you, um, and I started in inorganic materials. I started a group um, that did kind of exploratory nanomaterials, but I was in a group that service a military electronics. And I scratched my head as to how to be effective um, as a inorganic material scientist in a company where lasers and semiconductors and, and things like that were really, were really, really important. Um, that's how I got into strategy. Um, and from there, um, I, I put on a series of management changes, mainly because I asked a lot of questions and then when you ask a lot of questions, then they make you solve questions that you ask, and that's how you apparently get promoted. Um, and so um, now I'm uh, executive vice president, which means 
I have to um, uh, help sponsor and, and, and facilitate the research across the Israel enterprise. Okay. Um, but just to kind of summarize my perspective and career overall, really a lot of what I try to do is to look for what I call the, the white space. Thank God most of you are materials and mechanical engineers, so I can show an actually plot and, and not have to explain what that is. But basically, I, what makes the best projects from my estimation are projects that hit a area in the Ashby chart that is not covered by conventional materials. Right? And I usually look for attention in the system. So uh, what I'm showing on this slide is our, I wouldn't say ill stated, but not wholly successful work in morphing materials. We wanted to make materials that change shape during, during flight. Um, and as you can see on the low end, right, of um, strain, you can have um, ceramics. They take a lot of load, but they don't stretch very much. And on the other end, you have polymers, which of course take a lot, give a lot of strain, but don't take a lot of load. And what we needed for a morphing profile for our aircraft was something outside of the regime. And this is where material science and mechanical engineering kind of came into it. The group that I work with came up with two different ways of, of approaching this problem, either through ver variable stiffness materials, either through a composite or a cellular part. Right? And now you can kind of see where the cellular part kind of came in. But um, so HRL Hughes Research Labs, just a little bit of background here. It started as Howard Hughes' research laboratory, right? It has a very storied career of trying to do firsts. And that's what I was trying to influence uh, coming into the, the Hughes Research Labs. The laser, um, Nick Ted Naiman, was a, a, a uh, research laboratory scientist. His lab's still there. There's a char mark where the laser got away and burned a hole. We still keep it because we're very proud of that. But, um, right. The laser, uh, the first focus ion beam, which is shown on this chart, ion propulsion, um, actually liquid crystal displays. Those were all things that the Hughes Aircraft and Hughes Research Labs sponsored. Okay. Um, gee, in about the 2000s, though, the aerospace industry in Los Angeles disaggregated. Hughes broke apart. And through a series of acquisitions, we became owned by Boeing and General Motors. So we were no longer a central research laboratory, but we had two sponsors and owners. And um, I didn't work for a military electronics company anymore. I actually worked for companies who were really excited about spectral materials and inorganic materials. So that was uh, great for me, kind of dumb luck. But um, that's how that happens. And you can see our portfolio going far from there is a little bit more diverse, right? It's materials, it's certainly electronics to be sure, but you see things like um, memory stimulation and um, neuromorphic chips, right? As we served a, a broader um, So where we are now is um, HRL laboratories, because we no longer have a use name. Um, actually is on a tremendous growth trajectory. Um, initially, our mothership was the Malibu campus overlooking the Pacific Ocean in Malibu. Still a lot of our staff are centered there. But because of growth, we've had to expand to the local areas. Um, for those of you who know the California area, we are along the 101 corridor, um, which includes Calabasas and, and Thousand Oaks, um, and all the way out, Further up north on the coast of Camarillo. Our main areas of research are the size of the materials and microsystems, our uh, vision system, which is actually our infrared group. These are the group that are moving up to Camarillo because they're going to productize the work that has been done um, in IR. And actually, this is some of the reasons for growth, right? As a research lab, we are morphing from just making materials or, or showing 
technical results as proof and concept to actually producing prototype and subscale um, products. Like our camera being one of them, that's probably the first that we will widely do. I mean, I should back up and say we currently provide electronic parts, space ball flight parts to uh, fire jets. Right? So we do produce products through our clean room facilities. But um, we, we want to make that more global in our portfolio and take more things to product in global. Right? You're never going to support GM. You don't know, have that kind of volume or cost. But for small, I, you know, high performance, low, uh, low volume items, it's your all can provide that, and we are, are moving that way. So that's why we're growing. We're going to leave some bounds. Okay? We also do some of the microfabrication is our technology uh, lab, is our clean room center. Sensors and electronics, our heritage in, in electronics, optical and sensing materials, and then intelligent systems, um, our computer science and, and robotics. Okay. Um, the whole slide is we tout our product as being packed, but as, as I said, we are moving to low scale uh, product. Um, so it's not just about pets anymore. And while Boeing and General Motors are our owners, they sponsor 25% of the work that we do in HRL. 75% actually comes from community government countries. So our mission, okay, we are not a for-profit business. We are a mission-driven business. And our mission is to provide high technology solution and transition to our LLC members, Boeing and General Motors, or the government, these world-class high-tech solutions. Okay. Um, and with that, we our, our vision and what we are aiming for is to be the best in the areas that we cho choose to be in and to hire the best staff. And I, somebody asked me the other day, what keeps me at HRL? And it really is, even though we have this great video. So that is that is the Malibu campus. You can see me overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Everybody in the university is there. That is our campus. Everybody asks how we get work done with that kind of view. Um, I'm sad to say over a period of time, you kind of get jaded and you don't notice it anymore. But who you work with every day is just and what I'm just showing the rest of this presentation is a representative of the kind of work that the colleagues that I have do. I'm, I know I'm. So now that I'm in, in management, my, part of my job is to <laughs> help decide what projects can you do and don't, what makes sense. And everybody says, HRL, are you, are you like a university or but are you like a company? What are so we we say that we're we do inspired basic research. Um, there's a book by a guy named Don Stokes who wrote a book called Pastor's Quadrant. And what he was he was saying was um, you could do basic research like there's more. Um, there are people who do apply research like Edison, that is that you've heard the term Edison, and you just keep trying it until it works. Right. Or there's Louis Pasteur, who was trying to um, prevent the spoilage from wine, and in so doing, so he was youth inspired, a very noble cause, and then preserving wine. But he invented microbiology, excuse me, to address this need. Right. So he had a reason for doing it, but he used science. And and what we do is. Some of you may have been like I do, but with DARPA, you're very familiar with DARPA. So we do use what we call the Heilmeyer criteria, which George Palmeyer was a former DARPA director and was on our board actually for many years. And he came up with a set of questions, and they seem very simple, but they're very complex. Why would you want to do this project? What makes it different? Why is you know, how's it done today? And why would this make a difference? You know, those sorts of things. And we, we do ask every researcher to address these questions or, um, when, when proposing. Okay. So 
in the day of a researcher, what kind of projects can they work on at the drill? And it kind of speaks to our model. We are, we are called a leverage model, right? So we take money from a lot of different sources, um, but we pull it together to create a capability. That allows us to take less. Okay. So some of you have asked me today, hey, you're owned by going General Motors. They have their own research labs. Yes, in fact, they do. But they are tied more closely to the profit centers of their business, right? They have a place out in Malibu who they, they sponsor at half of the cost right, for the ownership, plus gets, you know, tremendous amounts of money from the government to augment that capability. So every dollar that they put in, right, there's a leverage, there's a, there's a factor, tremendous factor on um, people putting into HRL to solve a, a big problem, right? So that encourages us to take risk, right? So you can be constantly looking for really interesting things, things that are different. Again, going back to the Ashby plot, something that moves you into a wide space, right? Not just moves you along that. Okay. Um, we have internally sponsored R&D um, at our laboratories. This is the one where we say swing for the fences. Try it. You know, it, if it doesn't work great, fine. But we have a reason to try it. Let's do it. Many times this pans out. So a lot of times the crazy ideas that people come up with actually do work. And then we tend to go to the advanced project agency, start what we do want, MCMA, they kind of referred to was just that, right? We, and I will show the last materials that we tried. We go, oh, this, this actually looks like it won't work, you know? And, and then to the sponsors there go, what do you think, right? We might open up a whole new paradigm in material science. We started over. Okay? That program, and many like it, gets you up to prototyping and maybe answering some of the technical risks in a new technology, right? Once you get it to that point, then Boeing and General Motors, who are very application-focused, often become, this is where they go, okay, you know, now I can see maybe this will work for, you know, whatever, a, a bumper, a self-healing surface, something like that, right? And then uh, they will... Now we will do research to test it against a aerospace or automotive application. Um, for materials, suppliers always matter. Okay? Um, neither HRL nor monitor loaders are going to go into the materials production. Um, so that that always are suppliers as part of our story. Okay? Um, and one of the things I, I uh, also challenged. I mean, actually, for material scientists, it kills me to say this, but if you're a large integrated company, integrator company that are making cars and, and planes, you actually many times don't want to make new material, right? You want to have your supplier do it and, and, and bring it to you, and you want to trust that what they give you is perfect and just the way you specified it. And um, so actually diagnostics is a really important part of that story. As material scientists, we want to fix that, we want to test it. Um, but for those of you who have met today who do diagnostics, uh, being able to really diagnose something easily, right? Synchrotron came up, that's not easy. But um, something that you could do uh, to inspect and come in at the great area I think, that we don't pay enough attention. But the name of the game at the end of the day is to get you to get them on to product. Okay? Um, so, as far as maturity level, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the NASA GL, we're knocking your heads, okay? Technology readiness levels, and uh, this is kind of, this slide kind of shows what I showed in the previous slide, but in context of TRL and MRL levels. HRL usually is in the, the kind of the middle two to six TRL level, right? The higher TRL levels are usually sponsored by the user, right? Because it's user-defined um, acceptance, right? It has the operational readiness in there. Our university collaborations usually come in on the tier, uh, the low tier outside. Valuable, very valuable part of the relationship. So wanted to be really, really valued um, our academic collaborations. And then um, same in the MRL scale, the manufacturing readiness level. 
we, we tend to be on the kind of lower ends with working with suppliers, um, our owners at the higher. Um, the other thing that, well, actually, this is, has been a blessing up till now. And we have to consciously work to keep this um, now that we are spread, our researchers are spread among the sites, is our ability to work across lab um, between different disciplines. And I was actually, again, very encouraged to see that at top as well. Right? Um, we, we do have areas where there are big initiatives that we want to go after. I think I mentioned infrared, right? Um, yes, you'll have your, your material scientists who grow. We have electronics people who design the readout circuits. We have the thermal engineers who understand how to keep it at low temperature. Um, and then we have our wild and crazy researcher, who is telling Kevin, one of our researchers is actually curving with semiconductors uh, to make um, a curved imager. Right? Um, and almost all that blend comes into what we call a, a thrust area at HRL. There are several others, operational autonomy, um, low cost navigation. This is done with MEMS, MEMS processing, um, band-based RF microelectronics for the like, you know, wide band gap semiconductors. Notice novel, novel additive materials and design are in there, and I'll touch on that a little bit. And actually, uh, quantum technology. But the rest of the talk, the anchor myself in materials, the area that I know the most. Um, right now, I'm showing the smattering of where the current laboratory has uh, um, So, one thing I wanted to start with actually was um, the challenge of productizing advanced material. And we have to think about this actually from the get go. Um, so, sorry to say, but materials take a long time. Um, I wrote five to 15, and I took this in the paper, but like, quite frankly, you can get as many as 18 to 20, right? Um, and going from an idea to a product, there's a lot of risks along the way, right? Um, there's a lot of uncertainty. Let's talk to somebody about uncertainty complications. <laughs> Right now, uh, there's a lot of certainty along this process going from, and I kind of show a generic automotive uh, value chain on the lower right, right? You have materials and material suppliers, then it has to go to the next subsystem level, which could be a motor or a battery, and then it goes into the next level, which is usually some uh, automotive you know, subsystem. Then it goes into the car, and then it goes to the dealer, and then it goes to the customer. So you're very divorced many times, right? The materials, it's actually all rigged. Unfortunately, every one of those represents a place for someone to say no, to stop and say, I'm not sure why we're doing it. It's too risky. Okay. So the, the fact that that value chain is long is, is a little bit problematic. Um, the, 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 uh, engineer who's making the car in the red box there um, doesn't uh, doesn't always get to play with the materials, so they don't have a sense for that. That's a big risk. And um, when you start off with a new idea, you're not really sure that it's going to work. You're not going to really sure that it's working. You're not really sure that the market actually wants. It. So there's a here you're coming in with a lot of uncertainty. There is high commercialization costs too. Right. Um, you have to sometimes build reactors, you have to build reactors at scale. Um, and so, and, and how this will pay off is just always known. Um, but really, every application also requires to, to feel confident, right? To get rid of the technical uncertainty. Um, they want to understand how a, a prototype will actually work in their. In, in their application. So that means you have to think about the regulatory hurdles, the infrastructure barriers, and, and all the partners that you need to do there. Okay. Um, and many times on the left, what I show is in, in a traditional research laboratory, we tend to work with people to judge whether something's technically feasible. And then once it's technically feasible, we start again and work it up to the engineering line. It's operating when you think of the ball. 
Then it goes to another so fine. She takes the supplier and supplier management, and they try to make sure it's financially feasible. And then it comes down again, right? Now, that sounds a little daunting, but you know, it 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 can happen, and we try to ask as many questions up front to try to get us thinking about it and buy those down as soon as because in my experience delaying any of those just you know, with questions or thinking about it, or you'll get we'll it somewhere. Else. But you know, how many applications are possible in this thing, right? Um, can I actually make this at scale in the number that's required for the application? You know, what are the costs to be a, 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 in actual production? This one's hard, um, but good cost models or just an attempt at a cost model even early is a good thing to do. I know a lot of us don't like to do that. It's, it's brutal to see big numbers, but it, it gives you a sense for where you have to really work to bring down the cost if you're in the cost sensitive. And most everything the cost of the supply chain, and the team will have to involved, right? Um, what is the added cost? And then really the qualification of the certification requirement to actually use that. And actually that's can be the most expensive part of all of this proposition is actually the testing or qualification. So with, with this, I'm going to walk you through a few examples of things that we did at HRL, or we being a, a, a huge team, and, and kind of how this some of these things played out. So very simply, one of the obvious things that Boeing and Joe Motors we thought would want and going as well is light materials. Right? There's there's uh, fuel economy, um, remote the aerospace and automotive ends. Um, and so, yeah, okay, it's a very simple thing. Let's do something like waves. Um, so one of the things that uh, I was mentioning is introducing a new material into a well-honed um, engineering system is considered a risk. Right? People are very resistant to putting new materials in and in certain applications, like a space environment, you actually have to get it qualified to make sure that it does no harm to the vehicle in a space environment, right? How do you do all We became aware of some work being done in Cambridge in the early 2000s, where theoretically, if you could put some kind of architecture into your materials, so we wouldn't be inventing new materials, we would just be architecting them, right? And you have to go through all the qualification, but maybe there's a whole bunch of mechanical, interesting mechanical properties that we could get out of it. And, and I actually went to MIT with General Motors on this trip and saw some work being done on lattices. And the Cambridge work, that I alluded to was the theoretical work on what could be achieved with a lattice structure. Most structurally efficient, we see that kind of lattice in a, in a bridge, a Eiffel Tower, right? So we know that those things are good. But how do you make it at scale? Remember, we're trying to make vehicle scale. So what I saw at MIT was they were doing it with heatings, but they were stitching literally covered trucks, which is inherently not scalable. They're trying to make a plane. So the trick became, how do I do this at scale or can I? Um, just to get back, not to home or uh, beat the uh, factory plot <laughs> even further, but we also had to get a sense of what it is that we were trying to do, right? Were we accessing the space in painting so? And um, we, we did the um, simulations and studies, and we said, you know, we could, we could really access new space with our country, okay? Um, and we did. We we published. Everybody asked me if it's photoshopped. It is not. Um, one of the photographers, or our, I think our librarian, had a bunch of dandelions, so she put a whole bunch of the work, maybe only one or two, made it um, in, and they literally bounced a, a micro lattice. So this is a hollow nickel micro lattice on top of a dandelion. It had world record density. Uh, actually, for any material for about a few months. And then um, uh, we started a race after that. Everybody started, you know, 
almost changing the next bath, which is great, right? And the has got uh, lighter than one. Um, but uh, we, we showed that we can make a structural, ultra lightweight structural material. Okay. Um, but the trick was doing it at scale. And this was really, really the key as to what was new, right? So um, I have the fortune of working with a very clever person who um, actually wanted to go back. He had a master's degree, wanted to go back to PhD. And he was looking for, he was positively his background, right? And I was, said I'd seen this really interesting work at in MIT, but the way we'd have to work it was we'd have to come up with something really scalable. He went away for a while and he came back and he goes, hey, you know, in the fiber optics industry, they tried to make self-guiding fibers. And the way that happened was certain types of polymers, in this case, polyurethanes, when they, when they polymerized, they actually made a solid with a refractive index that caused it lensing. And, and so what, what happened is the, the poly, um, liquid would polymerize literally a lens and then move itself along. It would actually throw its own fire. Okay. And, so, and so what he did was he made a, a mask, he put it over this type of polymer, he exposed it, and these trusses literally grow up. Okay. So we could make large-scale parts in seconds. Right? Um, I think we now call it light casting. Um, we've, we've called it a lot of different things. So what we actually were able to make were a polymer lattice. Um, once we got into a polymer lattice, we could either keep it out of the polymer, we could scale it up, or we could coat. And the coating part allowed us to to, to make practices from a whole variety of materials. And we had a lot of fun for a while for coating everything we could think of and measuring the properties. Um, this is actually a material science and mechanical engineers green, just making a bunch of stuff and testing. Um, but we found that we could make many, many uh, materials in a lattice type structure uh, through a variety of things, right? So you could be electroplating. Um, we even did lost wax casting, which I don't think was kind of elegant, but you know, we, we wanted to see what the limitations were. Um, so the beauty in this is it allowed us three levels of hierarchy, or in engineering terms, three levels of control. Right? We could control the, the lattice unit cell. We could control the, um, the tubes and, and the angles. We could control the thickness of the, uh, of the film on the on struts. Right? And with that, we could access a variety of properties. And that control is really something that you we, we've already tried to, to make a process that's what you're so once we started to make these it then became okay but how much can you model this right um, and we actually spent a fair amount of time doing everything obviously from the atomistic materials modeling but we actually spent time modeling the polymerization reaction um, and with the goal of I want to dial in from the get go. Here's the property I want at the end for my structural material and, and dictate all the parameters that have to be true all the way through. And, and actually, we did a pretty good job of getting there. Um, uh, the other was really the, the mechanical problem, right? And I, many of you here know this now better than, than I do. Um, um, what kind of architecture is what kind of properties, but there, there was a lot of research uh, done. And this is this is what we took to MC uh, to, to DARPA and said, hey, you know, we think we've got something. We think there's a new paradigm for how materials can be designed, and we think it's worthy of a of, of, of DARPA take. Um, so they did. But from a business standpoint, we got really because we said, what can we make with this, right? There's all these business applications we have to do. Um, uh, besides just lightweight, making just lightweight um, bone replacements, right? We could make it out of pre-tomatic polymers and make high temperature things. We could make net shape cores. We could make padding or energy absorbing materials. Thermal came up, battery cathodes came up, there were a lot of 
and, and remember in my slides, it's like, okay, how many businesses would be impacted by this technology? Obviously, we have a lot. Okay. So one of the really cool ones was energy absorption. And here is where, again, the value of collaboration. We, uh, my group collaborated with uh, Lake Tony Evans, and he, he actually did um, some um, models and said, look, this a, a aluminum coated product material would be the lightest energy absorber per unit weight of any material. Um, and the reason being is when you crush a microscope, now it has to be down um, uh, on the face of it, but not only do you get buckling, right, but you get wrinkling. But the, the strut itself, and that's a, an extra energy absorption metric that a non linear structure is going to have. And that, that's why it was so much better. Of course, we did this one. Too, and they started a um, blast protection program to try to see if we could make a very lightweight blast absorber um, for uh, our vehicles. Um, so, so the next one was, oops, um, and actually, uh, more helmets with them. Actually, came up just using the polymer itself. Um, I will tell you that um, uh, there was, uh, <laughs> I haven't got to hold a whole day NFL contract. I, I, I was aghast at how heavy these things are, but the mere mortals like us cannot wear that. You, you need a super human you got. Um, but they're big and they're, and for kids, they're hot. And, and if you're playing in Texas, right, it, it actually, they will sometimes, they were having trouble with people taking it off. It's just too hot, right? Um, they also had to have multiple. And so the reason they like the microtrust is that not only, um, but it is over, but it, because it's regular, it guarantees work. Right? So they thought that the, they managed to the cool part of this. Um, so the group actually did win an NFL, money from the NFL. And what they did was, um, they actually compared this um, energy absorption versus foam, which is normally what's used in kids' homes, right? It's usually just a foam. Um, and, and show what the architecture could to help that situation. Uh, and then it not only, so a foam helmet has to be really hit, right? So it can't just crush and uh, and, and store it. It, again, you do no, no protection anymore. It had to be recovered and taken. So you can imagine how much fun my stuff had. Kidding. But um, this is this is the joy of fun. Um, and but we could show that we could improve the efficiency, impact efficiency. We're using smart architecture again. We were trying to avoid the bending modes um, on the phone um, and and intentionally architected so that we could do it. Get a high efficiency model. Okay. The other application was thermal, and, and, and we can flow because they're hollow tubes. I can flow uh, fluids through and air out on the outside. Um, I couldn't go into it, but I will tell you that some of the high temperature application models now uses some of the Okay, um, I think I told you we use blue ceramic polymers. We made the ceramic, so we have an carbide lattice. They can go up to 1700 degrees C, net shape. Um, so we've, we've shown that very high strength. Um, so, one thing I also wanted to show so that was labs. We did all that. Um, and then we said, what else could we do? Um, one area that was really intriguing to us was adaptive, um, what was with uh, structural damping. Um, and what we wanted to do was create a, a material that was stiff, lightweight, but could damp. And if you think about it, just elastics are not stiff. And while they damp well, they're structurally not very sound, right? And, and could there be something we could do about that? Long story short is we came up with negative stiffness. And long story short is they're metastable structures that are actually made stable. Our folks like to say, think of a Snapple cap, 
right? You have this button that you push through. That snapping action actually absorbs energy, okay? And uh, I talked to somebody earlier today, who showed me he can make sprays. So this is kind of what I was going for, right? Through the clever engineering of a negative stiffness element with positive st stiffness elements, we can actually make a lot of cool vibration. So, this is my challenge <laughs> to you. Lastly, I will tell you, um, we made all these great structures, negative stiffness, and the person that we talked to at DARPA goes, that's great, but how are you going to make it in volume? And we said, oh, darn, we got a single way of doing that. This is where additive came in, right? Could we additively print, but we knew additively printing meant using sub optimal design. So could we make it engineering relevant? Um, in fact, we could. Um, and I will say we targeted the uh, aluminum series of um, 6,000, 7,000, really 2,000 students as well to try to, what we had to do to get there was to overcome the problems that it has of um, our stress on, on on cooling. And it all has to do with microstructure, right? How could we control the microstructure during the printing to um, avoid what happens is calmer brain growth, right? When we get to the brain, you cool it down, it shrinks again, right? What we wanted was something equally axed and well controlled. The equally axed allows the strain to be controlled, okay? Fortunately, I have other children with my other um, architect and material people. They knew how to nanofunctionalize. And what they said is we can take aluminum powder, we can create um, inoculants or, or particles that are lattice matched, well controlled, and, and um, decorate the surface of a nanoparticle. And we can create um, a way for, for nucleation, energy nucleation to create occur in a controlled matter what you print. Okay. But that's so that's what they did. Um, they showed that they could do it with aluminum using very controlled buildings. Um we went through a lot of study on controlling and definition and understanding how this would happen. Right, we want it to happen just right, just ahead of the solidification front. So there was a lot of engineering as how to do that. But bottom line is we were able to create for the first time engineering relevant aluminum materials. And um, we had very fun printing in rock stuff as a result and showing that we could do it. I will say well, the mechanical properties are not exactly the same as capital uh, as So um, there's a little bit of work to be done yet, but it's good enough for many applications. So um, this is an area that is actively being worked right now. What works for aluminum also works for other alloys. It's, it's, this technology works more globally. It can work for high temperature alloys. Um, again, I can't show you all the work there for, for a bunch of reasons, but there are high temperature structures. We can pair high temperature metal with a printed or controlled porous um, thermal. Um, insert to be able to achieve uh, to accomplish materials that achieve very high temperatures. And, and this team has done that. So we've kind of married all the things that we've we've learned. Okay. So some of the things we've learned, right? Um, it unfortunately took 15 years for us to go from the idea of the micro lattice to actually getting it commercialized, used by actually the helmet um, so um, right there's a lot we can do up front to um, figure out, kind of prioritize which, which applications we should go We got that really excited when we get a lot of products, we should prioritize and get a lot of products. Ultimately, what caused problem was the cost, right? The cost of the material was just enough high, higher than what other people need to use so that the cost of adoption is considered a little bit too. Right? And that happened for, for most of the applications. Yeah. Um, just trying to cover the composition of the material wasn't a good strategy. We really went through the design, but, um, a barrier to entry, preventing others from using it just because of the way or the composition of the matter. That barrier is too low, everybody can get around. And um, actually, we saw a lot of complications that came out. 
even though we were trying to do something industrial relevant, publishing was really, really important because we had external validation that the science was true and correct. Um, so what happened to you, architect and materials, right? Um, so now I think I told you, we are going for thermal management in extreme environments. Um, that is where this is uh, pivoted to, both through metallic and ceramic systems. We're doing printed ceramics for electronics. Actually, it's a big, big thing. Curved focal plane arrays is another, understanding the strain of something that can true these full and active area. In additives, I, um, you actually need, we're going to transition that now from the motion hours to a supplier. And we pivoted to actually taking advantage of the fact that additive materials allows these interesting nerve structures. Right? We're, we're embracing the fact that it's a it's a non-equilibrium process that you can get some really cool stuff out of. And so actually we're using it um, for magnetics, clever magnetics for motors, and uh, graded structures for um, again controlled high temperature applications. Um, and actually, design is higher up in the food chain. I understand you know how, sorry. Um, and of course, like all of you, and we'd like to collaborate, I think, more in this area, rapid absorption, taking advantage now of cable quiz, modeling, and um, process sensing and, and characterization. Okay. Um, so, long story short, is what I wanted to do is tell you. Some HRL has kind of learned all these lessons, and we're trying to do some things to do it better next time, right? Where um, we need run these accelerators. Um, DARP is a great, actually, way of doing it. Um, but, you know, figure out ways of addressing the tech and market and sort of use a sooner product, right? Um, scale it up a little bit sooner, work with customers sooner, actually work with the academic partners earlier. And get that working um, Identify the market as early as possible, um, and it's really swing for the fence early. Um, we 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 do get to do this with other donors, government customers, but um, we 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 just keep getting better at every single time. Um, moving up the value chain, right? As we show that materials have a very long and complicated. Value chain. I do encourage people to work more with the users as early as possible and not put it on. Okay. And then um, IP and export strategy. Actually, you know, for hypersonics, this is really important, right? We cannot just um, take things uh, that we develop for hypersonics and, and, and just freely transport it, right? But if it would be good for something commercial, we have to keep that in mind up front and maybe to do it. Use that alloy right away from the hypersonics, maybe you can get that off. You can do the dual use first and then you really have to think about it. Okay, so what I showed you in the world when was really how HRL looks at architecture materials, but it's really the efforts of a very large group. And these are just some of the names, some of you recognize some of the names on here. Um, maybe Bill Carter, Tony Schaefer. Right, this is all their work, but really what was nice is this body of work allowed us to create a really um, exceptional team mm -hmm. to work with and to collaborate with. And then our external collaborators, I think, have really helped out. And um, we had collaborators at UC Santa Barbara, we had collaborators at Cambridge, and we had many, many, many collaborators. And, and that actually created a field much like Pastor's Quadrant, right, which is now giving and it continues to give. I'm really grateful to see that Hopkins is keeping up this area of research. Uh, it, it really is an important area. Okay, and with that, I'm going to, um, if anybody wants more details, I will leave the slides, you can read the papers. I'm not gonna go into details anymore. Um, but really, um, this is, this is the new off the back now, yeah. Um, we, are, we, are, we are looking for world class scientists, so on um, our website. Um, but with that, thank you very much for your attention. I hope you heard a little bit of, of the material business side of things, right? In, in a context that Hopkins actually plays a big part in, which is our kid. So thank you very much.
Thank you. Well, I think the bulk of our cohort is today is that you can't go across the levels, the HRL, TRL levels, and you do that very well. But I want to highlight the audience the fact that we're way at the beginning to the micro lattices, some things you're doing, the additives. When you're ahead of DARPA and you go to DARPA and say, you need to start a program at this, we've opened up a whole new field. That's remarkable. So, a tremendous team. And like I said at the beginning, they have a tremendous boss since uh, we're working with them and supporting them far more. Will you take a few questions? Sure. Yes. Other questions? Hi, that was a great talk. I was wondering with the functionalization of the aluminum uh, particles, how. Uh, that functionalization changed if you reuse the powders and if that affected the mechanical properties that we're seeing in the print. So actually that's really, really a really good question. Actually, the reuse part is an important part of keeping the cost of uh, models down. Um it, it does degrade a little bit, um, but uh, I think depending on the application, it actually can be reused. Um if it's really, really high performance, probably not. But um, we, we have done the studies to show that for, for cost reasons, you can't recycle the power, the unused parts, um, and, and we put it into the machine. Okay, thank you so much. Anybody else? You ready? I'm ready. Okay. So let's make Wesley one more time. So my job is just to say thank you, Dr. Oh, thank you very so, much. Um, marketing materials from Hopkins, so thank you very much for the lecture. <laughs> um, thank you very much to the Kraft family and Gordon in particular, but also to all of you for carrying on this work and being such terrific scientists here at Hopkins. With that, I believe we're allowed to get some treats great in the Great Hall, which is why you're all here. <laughs> so thank you very much.